right. Hi, everyone. My name is Dominic. Uh, I work as a developer evangelist for a company called Twilio. For those who don't know what Twilio is, Twilio is a cloud communications platform that allows you as developers to easily integrate different means of communication, such as voice, video, messaging, or really anything around communications into your applications using a simple set of REST APIs and client-side SDKs. But today I'm uh, here to talk to you about uh, how I hacked my coffee machine, um, or rather how I turned this coffee machine from my flatmate um, with some help of him and a couple of beers uh, into this thing that you can also see on stage here. Um, and yeah, so let's talk a bit first why I would do that. Um, and the main reason was that it's interesting. So I think uh, most of you haven't taken something apart for a while, right? Like when I used to be a kid, I would take my computer apart, kind of look into what's happening inside. And nowadays, company make it, uh, companies make it really hard for you to kind of peek under the hood. Like I think there's there's no way I can like easily replace anything in this MacBook, for example. Uh, and that's kind of intended by the companies, but it kind of loses, uh, makes us lose the touch with the technology as well, because we don't know what's going on on the inside, actually. Uh, the other thing is uh, I have uh, a lot of Alexa Echo Dots at home, uh, as well as a couple of IoT devices. So I have like lights that can be controlled and like different switches and stuff. But I never kind of built an IoT device myself. So the other idea was, can we figure out how to uh, use, like build something that we can then use with Alexa and other things? Like, can we build our own IoT device? And then the other fun thing that you can do with it is, uh, you can all grab your phones out now. I know a couple of people are constantly on the phone anyways. If you go to bit.ly slash vote coffee, uh, you can throughout the whole talk kind of vote on which coffee we're gonna make, and we're gonna make some coffee later on stage. Um, so just go to that URL and you'll be able to. Oh, I also figured out why, why my clicker didn't work. I used the wrong one. There's another one on stage. Uh, <laughs> so I can actually go, go like this. Uh, all right, so why would we use JavaScript for this though? Like the common language kind of to use for hardware hacking is C++ or like some sort of C++ that you can use with Arduinos, et cetera. Um, and the one main reason for me is that I haven't written C++ in ages, uh, last time in university and more involuntarily. Um, and I know JavaScript way better. I use JavaScript on a daily basis, so it was kind of a more intuitive thing for me and allowed me to code the whole thing faster. Uh, especially because we kind of like had the whole project, like the idea was we want to build this on a Friday night. Um, the other thing is it has to be an IoT device, so it needs to be able to talk to the web. And building a web server with JavaScript is fairly easy. Uh, certainly kind of dealing with web stuff is easier in JavaScript than in C++. Uh, on, the, uh, on the contrary, though, it's also more challenging because there's way less documentation on hardware hacking with JavaScript than there is on how to build something with an Arduino. Uh, I think there is a tutorial for pretty much anything that you want to build with an Arduino, uh, but not necessarily for everything you want to do with JavaScript. And then the other thing is hardware is uh, essentially event-driven, and JavaScript has the same event-driven nature. In both cases, we want to do something when a button is pressed. We want to do something when a value changed. Um, and these kind of things are exactly uh, what both of these share, and which makes JavaScript and hardware really nice. Uh, so when we kind of made the decision on building or like hacking our coffee machine, uh, the, we had a couple of options that we could work with, uh, mainly because I kind of ordered a bunch of stuff a while ago online and I really wanted to build something with JavaScript and hardware, but I didn't have an idea what exactly. Uh, the first option that I had at home was an Esprino. So Esprino is this uh, concept uh, of being able to write JavaScript on ESP8266, which are tiny microcontrollers uh, that cost practically nothing. Like, they're under a dollar uh, each. The nice thing about the Esprino is it comes with a web IDE that allows you to kind of write this. It has a bunch of built-in modules already. Uh, and then you can either use the ESP8266 or you can use this thing that you can see on the screen there, which is an Esprino Pico. Um, which kind of has the Esprino firmware already on it, and kind of works really nice with this web IDE, and it's a nice, nice kind of way to develop with it, but it had one major drawback for me, and that's it doesn't come with Wi-Fi by default. Um, so I could have soldered a Wi-Fi module on it, and I had one at home, 
But if you already have to kind of start with that with something where you don't have an idea where you're going with this, uh, it kind of like backed me off a bit. And I looked into other options that I had at home. The next option that I had was uh, a thing called Tessel. So Tessel is an open source project um, that currently has the, the latest hardware is the Tessel 2. Um, and the Tessel 2 is uh, awesome because it has built-in Wi-Fi, it has built-in Ethernet, it has uh, USB ports, it has analog and digital pins um, on, like, and plenty of them. Uh, and it's pretty cool, but the coolest thing about it is it allows you to write full no Node.js and actually store this on the device, which means that you can uh, rely on the existing NPM ecosystem and kind of leverage things like the built-in HTTP module. Or like, if you want to go crazy, you can like load something like Restify or, or Express into it. Um, and that's really cool, and that kind of motivated me to look into that. But there was a third option, and that's called Johnny5. Uh, and Johnny5 is uh, actually not directly a hardware project. It's actually a node module that allows you to interface with a bunch of different uh, pieces of hardware using uh, what they call I.O. plugins. So the default one that it comes with is uh, allows you to communicate with a set of Arduinos using the Fermata uh, firmware, which is kind of a remote debugging uh, firmware. And, uh, but you can also use this with, for example, particle photons and electrons. You can use this with a Raspberry Pi. Uh, pretty much for most uh, pieces of hardware, there, like most microcontrollers, there is a plugin for this. Uh, and this means, again, we can use the full power of Node. Uh, however, in some cases, we might have to run Node on a separate device. So for example, if your Arduino doesn't allow you to execute, execute JavaScript on it, um, you need to store this uh, code somewhere else on a Raspberry Pi or like attach the Arduino to a separate computer. Um, or in the case of particles, you can actually host the code in the cloud and then control it. But the really cool thing is that there is a plugin for uh, the Tessel, and that means we can use the power uh, of uh, Johnny5 and all the great things that come with it uh, and store the whole data on the Tessel and use that hardware to kind of run the code without actually writing code that is generic, uh, that is generic enough to not have to be run on a Tessel. Uh, so this is ultimately what we went for, and it's kind of like what I have on lying on the coffee machine. So let's talk about how we actually hack the coffee machine. Um, and disclaimer here, neither me nor my flatmate are electrical engineers. Uh, I had roughly two semesters in school, but uh, I can't really remember most of it. As you will see throughout the talk, I think my electrical engineering professor would kind of like shake his head. Um, but that also meant we approached this in a very scientific manner. Uh, we took a screwdriver and we opened this. Uh, and we kind of just took out every screw that we could find uh, until we had something that looked like this. Um, and kind of peeking a look at it, we found a few interesting pieces in there. Uh, they're all in this corner, um, and there are these three things. Uh, so one of them is the microcontroller. That's kind of the, the brain of the device. It's what kind of controls the, um, well, that controls the coffee making process. Then you have uh, the buttons outside, which is what the user inter uh, interacts with. It's what, what turns the machine on. It kind of what starts the coffee making. Uh, and then there's this interesting cable, which I labeled it, uh, because it's interesting because it can actually be unplugged. It's not soldered on or something. It's something that we can just detach. Uh, so that's what we did. Uh, we just took, uh, took out the button plate, um, removed all the casing of it, and then we're left with this. Um, so this is the button plate after removing the actual like, kind of casing of the buttons. Uh, and there are a few interesting things here. Namely, the most interesting one was the cable adapter itself, right? Uh, it has eight pins. Um, and so our initial idea was if we can kind of reverse engineer the protocol that is being talked uh, between the uh, control plate and the microcontroller, we can remove the control plate and just make two microcontrollers talk to each other. Uh, so we approached this by jamming a bunch of uh, jumper wires into one end of the cable, uh, kind of wrap wrapping some isolation tape around that, um, mainly to kind of make sure it doesn't fall out. Uh, and then uh, we connected the other side to the control plate to be able to uh, then kind of play around with this. Uh, so before we kind of approached that, we kind of thought about what we knew. So as you can see on the thing, there are eight pins, eight cables. Uh, there are six switches, six buttons that we want to be able to press. 
Um, and then there are seven LEDs on there uh, that are kind of typically right behind the buttons and would, t uh, would show the state of the coffee machine. So if, uh, the button, uh, if the LED under a button starts blinking, that means that one is in process. Um, if the bottom one slowly pull, uh, pulls this, that means it's in uh, standby, uh, et cetera. And then we kind of went to some assumptions. So one cable obviously needs to be power because we need to be able to power the LEDs. We need to be able to f figure out if a button is pressed. So at least one cable has to be power. Uh, and then if we, we have six buttons, so uh, if we kind of go with a binary flag approach, we would need at least three pins that are transmitting data and then the other button would be, uh, and then the other cable would be the power. Uh, and then we need at least three pins to kind of power controlling the, um, the LEDs as well. But what's the eighth cable for? That was kind of our mysterium for the beginning. But we, we were like, all right, we have a hypothesis, so let's test this. Uh, and this is what the first script uh, looked like that we wrote. Uh, that's all you need to do to kind of control the whole thing. Uh, so we imported the Johnny5 library, and then we um, imported the Tesla I.O. plugin that allows us to initialize a board with it. And then once the board was ready, we just initialized seven pins, uh, which were the every, one, every pin except of the one that we deemed as power. Um, I'll come to in a second to what, uh, how we figure that out. And then uh, we kind of put them all in an array and expose that array through the Johnny5 wrapper, which allows us to interact with it. Um, the reason how we figured out that one of them is uh, that the most right one on the big picture is power was by actually just, so the board, the Tesla comes with 3.3 volts and 5 volts. So we're like, eh, let's try 3.3 volts and connect that to the board. Uh, LEDs lit up, but they weren't really that bright as we expected them, because we're like, if we put the casing around, you can't really see the LEDs. So it can't be 3.3 volts, so what do we do? We put 5 volts on, uh, and that kind of like lit up the LEDs more, which kind of makes sense. Um, so we're like, all right, it seems like it needs at least uh, 5 volts, or at least more than 3.3, so we'll, we'll stick with 5. It's not like we have different ones, and we didn't really feel like playing uh, resistor math to kind of figure that out. Um, so um, uh, the one thing that we, the one problem we had with this was that when we started pressing buttons, we couldn't really measure anything because we, we initialized them in analog mode to figure out the voltage kind of ab across the different pins, but there was no real change because the, the values on analog pins are very fluctuating. Uh, so instead we modified the code slightly by just switching back to the default mode for every pin, which is a digital mode. And this means we, can, we can't read the actual voltage, but we can read whether it's high or low value. Um, and based on that, we were able to figure out that pins two, three, eight, and seven were kind of reacting on button presses when we were pressing the buttons. Uh, so we were like, all right, cool, there is a Johnny5 uh, Johnny class that allows us to initialize buttons, so let's try that. Uh, and we connected these ports to, uh, we created buttons for each of these pins and this is already where you can see the power of JavaScript and hardware, because all we had to do at that point was, hey, when the button is pressed, do this event, and else, uh, when it's released, perform this action. Uh, so this is really easy. We didn't have to write a, a loop that kind of constantly checked the values and remembered the previous values, but rather we were just able to say, hey, on press do this, on release do that. In our case, that was just console logging. Uh, and with this kind of whole approach, we started playing around with different different hypotheses and took notes and more notes and more notes. And they're really not that useful, uh, so don't try to understand them. It's mainly the idea we went with several bit flags to kind of figure out what if we send this, what if we send that. But we were onto something because we figured out a couple of things through this approach. Uh, the first thing was pin one clearly has to be power because it turned on LED four, five, and seven. It didn't turn on all of them, but at least these. Uh, pins four to six were able to control exactly these LEDs. So if we set these values too high, we were able to turn off the LEDs. Um, seven and eight always reacted on button presses. Um, so those clearly had to be some part of the button. And then uh, pin two was able to turn on th uh, the switches S3 and S4, which are the top two. And then um, the pin three was able to do the same thing with S1 and S2. So if you would set the power high on these, you would able to kind of measure button presses or not on pin seven and eight though. 
So that meant we were able to figure out if one of the buttons was pressed of the six buttons, but we were never able to tell which button. We could at most group it into two groups, so like half of them triggered on seven and half of them on eight, but that was all we knew. Uh, which meant we kind of had to go back to the drawing board. Um, we, we were like, all right, let's start from the beginning and try a different approach. Um, and I talked to a colleague and he suggested one thing that we ultimately went with. Uh, we started by taking a picture of the board. So this was the first time we actually used the picture before. We were always looking at this super tiny board um, and like really closely and trying to figure out what's going on. Uh, and when, once we had the picture, we took a software called Fritzing, which is an open source tool that allows you to create schemas um, of circuits. And we turned this, um, uh, this board uh, into a schema um, by kind of using a multimeter and then walking every path. So we started with a pin and then we walked on these paths to different places and we measured if the resistance between two points was zero, which meant that they were connected. Uh, and then uh, we dropped all the actual resistors because they didn't kind of change any behavior. And we ended up with this beautiful diagram, which seems way better, right? Um, but it was actually more useful um, because Basically, by walking the whole board, we were able to figure out a couple of things. Uh, first of all, if you're not aware of how LEDs work, uh, LEDs have this nice property that current can only flow into one direction, um, which meant that we were immediately able to figure out that actually three of these pins were uh, power, and then four, and six, uh, four to six were the ones that were able to control the LEDs to be turned on or off. Uh, and then seven and eight were still the buttons though. So we didn't really do progress on that except that we knew now how to control every LED on the board rather than just three. Um, I think at that point it was like 5 a.m. on a Saturday morning or something. Uh, we were getting a bit tired but luckily we uh, took another peek at the board and we found one thing that we kind of missed uh, probably because we were really tired. Three of these things that we deemed were uh, resistors were actually diodes. Um, if you know a bit about har hardware, uh, you know that diodes are like similar to LEDs, uh, that they can only let current flow into one direction. Uh, so we removed all the LEDs from our diagram and added the diodes and ended up with this more cleaned up diagram. Um, and this suddenly kind of made us realize that uh, the reason why we, like, we kind of understood now that uh, Basically, all the switches were dependent on a combination of um, two pins. So S1 was connected between P3 and P7, S2 was P3 to P8, and you see all of them map ultimately to seven or eight. That's why they always triggered. Uh, but they're kind of dependent on what we set as a value on the other end. Um, and that meant that we could kind of approach this uh, in a more, like we, we could actually solve this now. Uh, because previously we, our idea was, well, we just have a protocol that we send to the microcontroller. Uh, instead, now we were like, all right, the easiest way is if we can mimic the switches. And we had something for that at home, and that's called relays. So this is the wire up that we did, um, where we basically did the same wire up that we had in this diagram, uh, just that instead of the switches, we had these relays. And relays are like switches that you can control using power by basically setting a pin to a certain value. So we could programmatically control these switches rather than having to press them. Uh, and then we wired up the three LEDs that we deemed are interesting, which were power and the two status of the two ones that we wanted to be able to do, which is espresso and Kevin normal coffee slash grande. Um, and this was our first initial wire up. So you can see the coffee machine is still open on the side. Uh, we just put the cable up and then plugged in all the necessary stuff. The reason why the relays look really weird is because we didn't have enough jumper wires, uh, so we had to just turn it upside down and press it into the, um, into the breadboard. Uh, it worked, it still works, so it can't be that bad. Um, and then we wrote some new code. Uh, so we, uh, Johnny5 actually comes with a relay class, so we use that relay class to initialize relays on, five pi on three pins on the uh, Tesla. And then we um, injected them again into the REPL to be able to control them. And then we fired off this script. And you can see we kind of run Grande open. And once I hit enter, it starts 
brewing water, it's really hard to see there. Uh, but it, we didn't try it with coffee immediately because we were, um, we didn't want to waste any coffee, so we just ran water through it and poured it back in. Um, but it works. Um, so once you ran Grande Close, it kind of stopped brewing it. Uh, at that point, I think it was 7 a.m. on a Saturday morning, we kind of felt like sleeping, so we closed up the whole thing, put, some, uh, put the cable actually through the hole that was left by removing the buttons, and then put a sticker on, on top of it to kind of make it look nice. And um, the nice thing is that at this point, we can just plug it back in the buttons and everything works. So we never broke anything, and that was kind of one of our goals. Um, but so far, we only have a coffee machine that is being able to be controlled using JavaScript, but we don't really have an IoT coffee machine. Uh, we just have something that like, I can use in my command line, which is cool, but it does, it's not what we wanted. And this is where my favorite HTTP status code comes into play. It's actually a proposed one, but it's still like my favorite because it's so random. It's 418, I'm a teapot. Uh, and if you know the background, uh, you might be familiar with this. If you don't, that's the IETF RFC 2324, also known as uh, the thing that they propose in there is the HTC PCP, uh, which is the abbreviation for Hypertext Coffee Pot Control Protocol. Uh, so this was released as an April Fools in 1998 uh, by the IETF. And it's actually a great read. Uh, it's a lot of fun to read this. and we. As part of this coffee machine hack, I kind of read it multiple times. Uh, but it's basically based on top of HTTP um, as a protocol. And it adds a new brew method uh, as an alternative to post. Uh, it clearly marks in the RFC that uh, brew is not only limited to coffee. Uh, if you want to develop a like, beer brewing protocol, you can use the brew method there. Um, it alters the safe header to be able to also support if user awake, uh, if you want to make sure that your coffee machine only allows to brew coffee if, it's, if the user is awake. Um, and then accept additions uh, is a header that allows you to specify what kind of things you would like in your coffee. Uh, it also suggests a status code 418 that I mentioned before, which is I'm a teapot. Uh, and that one is purely for the reason that if you're trying to talk to a teapot rather than a coffee pot with the HTC PCP, it should reply with 418, I'm a teapot, to kind of set the ground there. Uh, and then it, obviously because we have a new protocol, we need a new URI scheme, so it uh, kind of defines the coffee URI scheme. Uh, and there's many more other things like new content types, etc. Uh, if you're wondering, this is how the accept additions definition looks like. Uh, so it has, covers everything from different milk types to different syrup types to different alcohol types. It also lets you add uh, things like spice types, even though it doesn't specify what the spices are. But I think that's only because uh, they want it to be future proof for things like a pumpkin spice latte or something. Um, this is the coffee or ice scheme, and I like that it's on a huge screen because it kind of makes it easier to read. Um, but this is great because um, one thing that they highlight in the, in the, CF, uh, in the RFC is they say that uh, internationalization is very important for this, uh, and that, for example, in German, the K of Kaffee, which is the German word for coffee, needs to be spelled with a capital K, uh, because that's how you do it in Germany, and therefore you need to encode it. Uh, that's why the German protocol is actually percent for B Affe um, versus just Kaffee. Um, so I kind of like had to had to giggle a couple of times there. Uh, the other thing is it kind of tells you that afterwards you just have a host similar to uh, to like normal HTTP, and then you have a pot zero or pot one, etc. If you have a coffee machine with multiple pots. Um, now the cool thing is obviously we had to implement this, uh, and it kind of works. Um, we implemented a subset of it based on some limitations, uh, but it's actually working. So I'm going to jump at this point into some demo. Uh, parts here, so let me clone this. Uh, all right, so I need to restart my, um, so right now this is tethered because of the internet connection, it sometimes crashes, uh, so I'm gonna boot this up. Um, all right, so let me switch to this. So while this is booting up, I'm gonna show you a bit of the code. Uh, this is the wrong one, this is the right one. So what we have at the core is um, this fi uh, file, which is just a normal index.js. What it does is it creates a new HTTP server, 
uh, and then it starts listening on a certain port, and then we use a, uh, use a tool called Local Tunnel to be able to expose an HTTP tunnel so that we have an externally addressing uh, URL versus just an IP that might change. Uh, and then once we have all of that, we create our coffee machine instance, so I kind of factored out all the actual coffee logic into a separate class. And once a coffee machine is ready, uh, we, we're good to go. Uh, so when a HTTP request comes in, obviously the first thing we need to check is our, if our coffee machine is a teapot. Uh, I just had to do this. Uh, it's just a Boolean flag on the class. And then we check for uh, the respective headers. Um, all right, this was a click to kind of let me know that this booted up. Um, it tells us um, kind of the content type, which is as a response message coffee pot. Uh, and then it, we can either get the kind of status here, so we can try this actually because the coffee machine is on. Uh, so I have the, uh, I use Postman here. If we just do a normal get request to this, it tells us is on true, so the coffee machine is working, uh, that's great. And then the other thing it supports is uh, post and brew methods, obviously. I don't think the brew actually works. I didn't really get around to trying to do a brew method yet because I didn't really feel like writing an HTTP request by hand. Um, and most kind of clients don't support brew for whatever reason. Um, and then it checks if it's the correct content type. So the correct content type has to be application slash coffee minus pot minus command. Um, and it only supports start and stop. Uh, and then if that's obviously not the case, we return the correct thing. Uh, I do check if it's authent authenticated because it is an IoT device, so I should probably not let the whole world play around my, with my coffee machine when I'm not there. Um, then we check for the additions and kind of filter for the ones that are valid for our coffee machine. If you try to request anything that isn't valid, um, we reply with the respective not acceptable. Uh, and then we parse the whole thing. So here I had to change the URI scheme a bit because uh, old school coffee pots only supported one type of coffee, which is coffee. Um, my machine supports more. So I kind of created sub resources, which are espresso and grande, which allow us to define which ones we want. And then if we just go to pot zero and send start and stop, it kind of turns it on and off. Um, and then we kind of press the button, so I'm going to show you quickly how that looks like. This is all the kind of filtering logic here, so you can see all the additions that are supported. Um, so if I go into the Latissima class here, um, you'll see that obviously it's not a teapot. Um, by default it's on because if you switch the power uh, switch, it is on. And then uh, we initialize the board and uh, then create these relays, so similar to the code that I showed on, on the slide. And then we have these two press functions, uh, but what they do in, under the hood is, is a bit interesting. So there are two ways uh, this coffee machine can, what, what we figured out through the whole thing, uh, can be interacted with. One is if you press a button and keep it pressed, and then after a while release it, it will only brew coffee while you're keeping it pressed. But if you press it shortly and release it, it will only brew as much coffee as necessary for the respective size. So if we want to brew an espresso, we don't need to time it. We just press it shortly and then release it, and it will just brew an espresso. So uh, we kind of did this by using set timeout and just release after 500 uh, milliseconds. With that being said, um, so I said, we, we, let's check. This is still on. Um, so right now this is tethered. It doesn't have to be tethered. Uh, it's just because the uh, internet connection is a bit flaky here. Typically I have it connected via ethernet. Um, so the local tunnel sometimes crashes. Uh, so this way we can see that it's actually on. Now hopefully you all voted for some coffee. Um, so I'm gonna jump into some code here. Uh, this is basically just some boilerplate code that is, uh, grabs the kind of voting lists that you've been all voting in uh, using Twilio Sync. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to grab the espresso and grande votes here uh, by mapping through these and grabbing um, zero index plus one. So this should be the votes. Uh, let's console log this. And then grande. All right, uh, the other thing we need to define is what type we want to make. So that's um, if espresso 
has more votes or equal to Grande, it's gonna go for Espresso and else for Grande. And then uh, we need to construct a URL here, so that's already have that stored. Um, we need to put the make type in here. And then this is my security right now. And I'm gonna put the uh, token here. Do I copy? I know it's token. All right, and then we need to do a get a post request to the URL. And then um, we need to specify here the headers, obviously, which is, uh, so this thing actually supports two things. Uh, I'm gonna show you in a second why. So the content type can be text plain or it can be application coffee pod command. And we need to pass, pass the body as start. And then, cons uh, and then this is a promise. Um, enjoy your Cool. Um, but before we fire this off, uh, I initially said that the whole idea of uh, this thing was we wanted to be able to control this with Alexa, right? And the reason why we built this API, I mean like the HTCP, uh, HTC PCP part was just a fun part around it. Um, the reason why we wanted an API is because it allows us to do this. Uh, so I have a couple of if this and that triggers set up, or if. So we, this was the easiest way to kind of integrate this with Alexa. So we have a trigger Latissima, which is the one that turns it on and off. And then we have trigger coffee and trigger espresso, which allows us to start this. And what they do under the hood is uh, they basically just do a post request uh, to the respective endpoint. And that's why the token has to be like a query parameter, because I can't set custom headers here. Uh, so I'm passing the authentication token through uh, a query parameter. And then the content type has to be text plain because the other ones aren't valid anyways. So I went for text plain, and then we pass and start. Um, so this works as well. I didn't bring in Alexa as well because it was already kind of interestingly enough to fly this from Berlin to uh, Croatia. Um, so while I'm anyways here, I'm gonna check once more if some of you voted via Twitter as well because that was an option. Can't check your applet right now. All right, um, so seems like that failed on me. Um, but hopefully you all voted, so I'm gonna execute the script right now. And uh, if everything works well, this should be, um, we should have some coffee brewing, so are you all ready? Uh, fingers crossed. So uh, we should retrieve the votes, so the votes were there, and then it tells us bad gateway, because on the left side you might have already seen the internet connection broke on us again. Um, so I'm gonna just re-execute this. Uh, so on that side for Tesla, there are two commands, T2 run, which kind of runs the JavaScript, and then there is uh, uh, additionally uh, T2 push, which allows us to kind of push the script on it so that whenever you plug it into power, it auto-executes that one. Uh, so later, you don't have to have this connected to your computer. You can just put this somewhere, plug it into the wall using a normal kind of adapter, and then it will work as well. All right, so this is deploying right now. Uh, it will take a couple of seconds. Um, in the meantime, I can show you one more thing on the code. That's not the one. Um, so actually, uh, read analog. I think this was our main debugging script. Um, so you see we went through a couple of approaches here and kind of commented out a bunch of stuff, tried different things. Um, and had, I think this was the, oh yeah, this was the kind of bitwise operations that we at one point did to kind of loop through every binary flag. I forgot where I'm generating the flags, but uh, basically I was like kind of generating a bunch of different flags and then iterated through them. Cool, the script seems to be going again, so let's start this. Oh, that was quite a lot of votes, good job. Uh, but espresso one, and it seems like coffee is brewing. Let's see. There we go. So we got some coffee. Uh, 
I think was, this was the first time, it smells really nice. Um, I think this was the first time on stage that someone brewed coffee. If, if you know someone who did that before, please let me know. Um, but I think this was the first time. Um, all right, so if you want to check out the code that I built, uh, that I wrote, it's actually on GitHub, including the wire up that I did um, and the testing script. So if you want to like take a, p a bigger, a better look at the kind of horrible kind of duct taping code that we did before to test this, uh, feel free to check that out. Um, let's talk a bit about kind of what I learned during this. Uh, first of all, reverse engineering is a lot of fun. Uh, especially if you kind of do it with a with a buddy and just grab a couple of beers, uh, this can be a lot of fun. Uh, especially because companies try to make it so hard, as I said, to let us peek under the hood of devices. We tend to forget what's actually going on under the hood, um, and we tend to forget that this is pretty much similar to kind of any other computer that we interact with. Um, uh, so it's a lot of fun, but it can also be horribly frustrating because I think we burned through like at least two of the LEDs on the control board because we were playing around with things. Uh, we're just like putting current on things. It was like suddenly it started smoking. Uh, so this can be horribly frustrating because there's first of all no git revert on hardware. You can't be like, oops, let's try this again. Um, similarly, there's no control C. Like <laughs> it, if it's in, it, like you can unplug it, but like at that moment, it's most likely too late. Um, and if it, if you're hacking in the middle of the night, like we did, it's kind of hard to get replacement parts. You can't be like, all right, you know, like let me just re-download this. Like you need to go to a hardware store and buy something new. Um, so it can be b frustrating as well, but it's really rewarding once it works. Uh, JavaScript and hardware work really nicely together. It's a lot of fun. There are amazing open source communities that you should definitely check out. There's a thing called NodeBots. They have meetups across the world in different cities uh, that all they do is they build things with hardware and JavaScript. Uh, there are also really cool um, websites on this and uh, blogs. Um, the Tesla 2 is great. It's a great kind of project for uh, uh, it's a great open source project, it's a great open source community. You can find everything that they do in their GitHub organization, so they're very transparent. It's not an actual company behind that project. Uh, similarly, Johnny5 is awesome. It get, allows you to get started really easily. Uh, it comes out of the box with so many classes that allow you to do so many things and interact with a bunch of different hardware, di uh, hardware pieces. So if you want to use a potentiometer, that's there. If you want to use... Uh, various like RGB LEDs versus normal LEDs, that's all there. Uh, it kind of comes with a bunch of stuff out of the box, including kind of instructions how to wire this up. So if you're new to hardware, they will tell you even like, all right, get this, get this LED, wire it up like this, put the following things there, and it just works. Uh, so it's really cool. What's next for the project? Um, first of all, we want to programmatically be able to determine the state. Right now we have a flag that uh, keeps track of whether the coffee machine is on or not. It's sort of a problem because um, after a while the coffee machine goes into standby, which is something we can't really detect right now. We can see it on these like LEDs that are on the board, and I can show them later to you if you want to. Um, but we can't really programmatically detect that right now. And the reason for that is that the uh, circuit uh, of the Tesla and the circuit of the coffee machine don't share a common ground, and therefore we can't just measure the voltage, uh, which would just solve the problem. Uh, so there's a thing called optocoupler, which allows us to kind of transfer, like measuring the voltage between two different circuits. Uh, so we might get some of these to kind of figure that out, uh, because ultimately we just need to figure out if the LEDs are like blinking or if they're strongly on and these kind of things, and then we were able to figure this out. Uh, we also want to add more relays, because right now we have, we have four relays available, but we only hooked up three. Um, ultimately, we want to be able to hook up all six switches to have like the full power and be able to uh, use the milk pump to probably like either use milk or connect whiskey or something to it, to have like some Irish coffee in the morning. Uh, <laughs> and uh, then we're up for suggestions. If you have some cool ideas, like I heard some ideas like, we should totally have an NFC reader that determines whether there's a cup standing below it um, or things like that. Uh, I would love to hear your suggestions. Uh, if you want to read more about the whole process and see a bit more pictures, um, 
I wrote the wrote a blog post about this and published it suitably uh, on April 1st uh, this year, so 19 years after uh, this was suggested. And uh, so you can check that out, the URL is there. I'm gonna tweet about this as well. Uh, similarly, the slides are gonna be on this URL. Again, I'm gonna tweet right after this session both of these links, uh, so you can check all of that out. I'll also, during the next coffee break, I think there's one more talk after this, but then there's coffee break, I'm gonna take this upstairs, so if you wanna uh, uh, peek, uh, take a look at it, uh, you're more than welcome to do that. Uh, with that, thank you everyone. Again, I'm Dominic. Uh, I'm Kundal on pretty much everything, uh, so you can uh, contact me anywhere on the web if you want to, or just have a question later or uh, later at the uh, party or during the coffee breaks. And thank you everyone for paying attention. I hope this was uh, a bit entertaining and a bit informative as well. And thank you everyone. <laughs>